I'm very pleased to be here um, again in Poland, having come to Poland on and off for quite a few years and having witnessed in Poland the um, practical uh, uh, embodiment of some of the most profound questions and conflicts about solidarity, nationhood, Europe, secularism, democracy, and the other issues we're discussing today. So it's a great privilege to share some thoughts with you I have today. I won't attempt to fully summarize my paper. It will be available either now or shortly uh, for anyone to read if they wish to do so. I'll simply say uh, what the central theme of the paper was and then relate that theme to the conversations that we've been having, the dialogue that we've been having up till now today. So I'll try and comment on some of the exchanges with previous um, uh, speakers and with my uh, uh, interlocutor in this session whose paper I have also read. Um, the, the theme of my paper was um, related to uh, what was uh, a theme in um, Gianni Vatimo's uh, lecture, which was the idea of unity. Um, and uh, there, uh, um, a thought was expressed with which I agree, which is that the pursuit of unity in the world or in society, or even perhaps in thinking, can be dangerous. Um, it can provoke various evils and will in any case fail. Um, my paper was concerned not so much with the pursuit of unity as with the belief which um, emerged uh, sometime perhaps in the 18th century and was strong in the 19th and 20th centuries and has been influential even in the 21st century, the belief in unity as a political condition which will emerge from the process of modernization. To put it in a different way, um, uh, the, there has been a dominant secular belief that um, the process of modernization or even history as a whole can in normal circumstances only have the result of producing a, a universal or a near universal convergence on a single type of political system. Now there's never been any agreement about what this system would be. If you go back to the 19th century, um, Marx thought it would be egalitarian communism, uh, Herbert Spencer thought it would be laissez-faire capitalism. Auguste Comte thought it would be a kind of uh, um, neo-feudal industrial hierarchy. John Stuart Mill thought that it would be a complex system of liberal democracy. So there were radically different conceptions or visions of what this end state would be. But uh, the idea that there would be an end state, not inevitable, none of these thinkers were historical determinists. All of them kept open the possibility that the process of convergence could somehow be retarded or even derailed. But uh, short of such disasters and apart from contingent difficulties, each of them believed that somehow it was part of what it means to be modern. It was a kind of categorical imperative of modernity that it would eventually produce a universal or a near universal regime that most countries in the world, as they became more modern, would um, become more similar uh, and they would become more alike. So there was essentially a kind of one uh, unity uh, uh, was at the end of the um, um, historical process, not as an inevitable end, but as the normal result of modern historical development. Now, um, this belief was dressed up as science, as social science. Of course, in Marxism, it was dressed up as a, later on at least, and perhaps in Marx himself, certainly in Engels, as a science of historical materialism. In Spencer, it was dressed up as a sociological theory uh, uh, um, of industrialism um, uh, and of survival of the fittest between different regimes or systems of production. Uh, it was Spencer, not Darwin, who invented the phrase survival of 
um, uh, of, the, of the fittest. And even in Mill, uh, it was thought that a future type of social science would be developed, which, so to speak, showed, demonstrated, empirically demonstrated that only one type of regime could ultimately prevail throughout the world or most of the world. So it was supposed to be science, but in my view, it wasn't science. It was a secular replica of um, Christian theodicy. Because the idea that history is a teleological process, that history has any kind of end state, that it's not simply like the seasons, a set of recurrent cycles, uh, as for example, pre-Christian Europe believed the Greeks and the Romans. If you read the Roman historians, there's no idea of universal history and certainly not of a teleological history. It's not there at all. If you read the Indians and the Chinese, it's not there either. It's essentially a, a, um, a Christian idea, um, even different in some respects, I think, as, uh, as uh, Shlomo said, from, from Jewish ideas, actually, as well. Uh, uh, it's, uh, and, and in other words, what this... Um, idea of eventual regime convergence, very influential, not only in the 19th century, but at the end of the 20th century in Fukuyama's argument that only one type of government or one type of system, namely democratic capitalism, is the only one that was ever going to be legitimate in future, very influential, and did give some, so to speak, intellectual support to interventions in Iraq and elsewhere. This idea is, in fact, um, um, a replica of uh, a theological um, commitment. And um, in other words, it's not based on evidence, it's not based on, it's a faith commitment. And a surprising amount of Western policy is actually faith-based rather than based on um, empirical estimates of the success or otherwise of different policies in promoting different goals or, or values. And um, this brings me to uh, my three comments on the dialogue, as it were, that we've had up till now in these discussions. The first of them, my three comments, relates directly to what I've said just now, which is the continued ubiquity of faith um, and, the ambigu and the ambiguities of secular culture and of secular uh, thinking. Um, I think the idea of, the very idea of secularity, the very idea of a secular culture or of secular thinking is much more problematical and almost enigmatic than we suppose. Because what happened with the growth of secular thinking was not that the categories of thought which shaped Christian thinking were abandoned, but the beliefs were. The categories of thought in many cases persisted. And among those categories of thought was the very idea that history is a teleological process, a meaningful process, even a process of redemption. It's the idea that history uh, had a kind of redemptive aspect uh, built into it with all of its tragedies, difficulties, breakdowns, crimes, horrors. Um, uh, there was a kind of um, redemptive feature in it and even liberal rationalists held a kind of view rather like this. Um, Maynard Keynes, the British economist, wrote a rather wonderful short essay called My Early Beliefs, in which he treats his early self more or less as an idiot. He says that when I was a young man, I believed the following things and so on. Uh, now I know that most of my earlier beliefs were nonsense. And um, one of the things which had always struck me is he said of Bertrand Russell, he said he was one of the most intelligent people I'd ever, he'd ever met. He said, Bertie, he says, this isn't one of his lectures, reprinted as an essay, my early beliefs. He said, Bertie believes two remarkably incompatible things. He said, first of all, Bertie believes that history up till now has been a nightmare of horror and crime. He said, but the solution is simple. People should simply start being reasonable. Now, <laughs> that's not exactly, it's a kind of redemptive act of reasonableness which will suddenly intervene, almost like the divine intervention into history which Christians believe occurred, and transform history. Maybe not at once, but transform it. And that view is, I think, not found in pre-Christian European history or in lots of non-Western histories. They assume that the history of the future will be much as like the history of the past. There may be new technologies, there may be new forms of communication, changes in language, different imperial power structures, but um, the essential forms of ethical and political conflict will remain unchanged. <clears throat> 
So my first point would be about the ubiquity of faith, but the faiths which have been ubiquitous, as it were, in the last couple of centuries actually haven't primarily been, at least in Europe, um, traditional religions, Judaism or Christianity, for example, but secular offshoots, secular replicas, secular avatars, if you like, of monotheism and in particular of, um, of, uh, of Christianity. And it's in a way the retreat of those secular religions, which is, I think, one of the background factors with the revival of traditional religion in many countries. Namely that as these secular replicas, which preserve the categories but not the beliefs of Christian thinking, uh, uh, weaken and crumble or, or are compromised or no longer believable because of the failure of communism, because of the failure of uh, the failures of um, uh, uh, um, democratic sort of imperial democratic liberalism to re reproduce democracies in various parts of the world. Traditional religions, well, it's one of the reasons, not by any means the only one, resume their role in public life and become once again centers or sites of conflict, even in societies which have otherwise been highly secularized. When I began my academic work in the 19, late 1960s, early 70s in Britain, every single book that I was instructed to read assumed as an axiom that secularization would be ongoing in Europe and the world as a whole. Every single book that I was taken as a kind of axiom of academic discussion of social theory, um, of, of any kind of um, uh, serious thinking. And I think it's not proved to be the case because even in societies which are secularized by conventional social scientific standards, that's to say not many people go to church, they don't respect rituals and so on, or they may not declare beliefs, even in those societies, issues which are essentially religious issues and even explicitly religious issues have re-emerged. And the key thing is I think that religious allegiance has become a matter of identity again. Religious allegiance with Christians uh, saying I'm a Christian, it's a key point that I'm a Christian, um, or I'm not a Christian, I'm an atheist is the key point. That's why I think the following things and I'm going to enter into political life and attempt to embody this identity and, and defend it against attacks upon it, uh, which from other sources. So in fact, religion has actually become, re-entering political life, a form of identity politics in Europe, which I don't think many people expected. They thought that the identity politics would be really within the category of, national, of nationalism, but of course, to some extent it is still, and certainly in Poland, within the category of nationalism, but it's also in, in Britain and elsewhere independent of it. So faith has remained um, ubiquitous. Now, um, along with that, and this is my second point, um, ideology has not gone away. I mean, one or two of the um, uh, um, contributors here have suggested that we're in a kind of post-ideological um, circumstance in which we just have bureaucratic rules or the assertion of, of power. Now, of course, there's some truth in that. But I think, actually, if you look at the language with which policies are defended, such as the, the welfare state for, uh, and others, to the extent that they are defended at all, it's, it's essentially a, an economic language inherited from neoliberalism. It remains the only functioning discourse or the predominant prevailing discourse in politics. And the types of policies that are being adopted in many countries uh, including most European countries as a response to the economic crisis. I'm not necessarily saying that there are alternatives or that can be worked out at this stage or I'm not making any comment on that. Maybe there are, maybe there aren't. Um, but I'm merely making the observation that the policies that are discussed and, and contested are discussed and contested predominantly in a language inherited from neoliberalism. The ways of thinking are inherited, so we need more privatization, more fiscal orthodoxy, we need to do more marketization. In other words, the central categories are still what they've been for the last 20 or 30 years. That the conquest of politics by neoliberal thinking, which began in the 1980s, remains, even though uh, the problems that we're dealing with might not really be soluble in that way. Now, some people have asked, perhaps I can be allowed to be slightly mischievous here, some people have asked, well, why is it that Economic, economics has not changed. That was a question which Ivan Krastev, and I think he might share my view that um, 
while economic theory is not particularly useful in predicting market behavior, it's rather powerful in predicting the behavior of economists. That's to say the, um, uh, there are many economic reasons for reproducing a certain type of what they might call intellectual capital um, connected with their own role in particular institutions, but there's maybe an even deeper reason. And this takes us to China, which is, uh, takes me to China, which has recurred as a several points in our conversation today. If you read economic historians and economic theorists, and you try to get the most sophisticated and plausible account of why and how economic growth or capitalism in the broadest sense develops, what you will find if you put the ideologues on one side, if you put Milton Friedman and, and Hayek on one side and look at even kind of relatively unideological historians, they will all say that what you need for capitalism and rapid economic growth is a rule of law and settled property rights. Now my observation is that neither of these exist in China. There is no effective rule of law in China and there are no settled property rights in China. And yet, despite that, um, there has been the largest um, uh, and fastest industrialization in human history. So this is an enormous, if you like, an elephant in the room of Western economic theory. How can this be possible? And so that's another reason why I think economics as, as a whole, there may be some economic thinkers who've, to whom this does not apply, has not really had anything useful to say about the um, about the uh, uh, crisis. So we still actually, in a sense, t talk and think in terms of an ideology which we, so to speak, are half consciously aware does not describe the world and doesn't really adequately comprehend the world, in which the world is already falsified, actually. History is already falsified, but we have no alternative. And that, I think, generates this kind of peculiar cognitive dissonance which we have at the moment, which is that we're aware that our categories and ways of thinking don't work but we carry on using them despite that because we have no functioning um, uh, alternatives. Now my third um, uh, of these three thoughts um, suggested by our dialogue might seem and perhaps even is inconsistent with the first two because the third is the persistence of heterogeneity and, and in particular there might be a conflict here with uh, the second thing I mentioned which is the persistence of ideology because we still have, so to speak, semi universal ideological claims are often made. If you read commentary on China, for example, quite a lot of Western economists say the laws of economics apply in China. There will be a crash. House prices are too high, uh, uh, et cetera. And I'm not denying that there may be a crash. I'm not denying. I mean, I think um, it would actually be foolish to, uh, to assume that this present experiment in China is immune to crisis. If it did crash, by the way, that doesn't mean that Western capitalism, American or Anglo-Saxon or European versions, would necessarily get stronger. Because the challenge to those doesn't only come from China. It comes from Brazil, it comes from, I would think, even down the road, it might come from Africa, it comes from uh, India. The shrinkage in West is not only a phenomenon of, of China. But I'm interested that there is still a powerful discourse around which says there are universal laws of economics and these are are operating in China, so there will inevitably, these people say, be a crash. I think there might be a crash, but it'll be for contingent reasons, and it'll be strongly resisted by the elite, by the communist elite, which still remains pervasive, powerful, and young, a lot of it. It's not just an aging gerontocracy. Uh, so there could be a crash, but there's nothing inevitable about it. But it may seem, um, uh, it may seem um, inconsistent to talk about the persistence of universalistic thinking and um, the um, persistence of heterogeneity. Well, let me cite, I think, the greatest 20th century Enlightenment thinker who observed um, it is only in contradiction, it is only in logic, it is only in logic that contradictions are forbidden. I don't know if any of you know that, it was Freud, the greatest 20th century Enlightenment thinker. In the real world and even in human thinking, contradictions abound. And what do I mean by the persistence of heterogeneity? I'll just say a few things about this and then conclude. First of all, I think there's great heterogeneity within the non-West and within Asia. Somewhat different from the accounts of China which have been given by others, my impression of China is that, it, is that at this stage of development, it is a strongly Hobbesian state. 
That's to say the state institutions are extremely powerful and all-pervasive. They exist at every level of, of the society. Um, there are some Hobbesian traditions in Chinese thought, legalism. If you go back to the theories of the rectification of names, the idea was that language would be changed by the state. That, by the way, directly uh, uh, parallel to what Hobbes himself argued. He argued that as a sort of early Derridean deconstructionist, he argued that the Bible had no internal meaning, no inner meaning. The meaning was what the sovereign gave it. And the reason he adopted that view was that if everyone accepted the sovereign's meaning, there would be no conflict, there'd be peace. But it's a kind of early Derridianism because he said inherently these marks on the pages or these words have no meaning. They're given a meaning by an act of will. That was more or less what the legalists also thought. My also impression is Chinese society is extremely weak. Um, uh, compared, for example, with society in Taiwan uh, or in Japan or in India, which are also parts of the non-West. But a kind of weak society. So the non-West is extremely diverse and, and heterogeneous, just as the West is and just as um, Europe itself is. And one or two brief comments on Europe. I entirely endorse the uh, uh, drift, of the, uh, the, the comments of... Um, of Shlomo Avinieri and others, uh, but particularly Shlomo on Europe today. I mean, the history of the last few years has really been the history of a type of transnational utopianism coming up against the fact that the, the one institution which has deep democratic authority is still the nation state. There's nothing above it. There are one or two transnational nation states, Spain, Britain, Canada, but they're all, legis they're all in leg relics of monarchy or empire. One of the paradoxes of cosmopolitanism and of transnationalism is it seems best achieved in antique institutions. Modern institutions seem to develop towards nation states. And I interpret China in a sense, like Japan in the 19th century, as involved in a project, in some ways a kind of rather cruel and, and a harmful project, but nonetheless it's bent upon it for reasons of survival to some extent of turning itself into a modern nation state, which is what Japan did in the Meiji period in the 19th century, and what China is doing now. And that involves ironing out ethnic differences, not only in Tibet and in um, uh, regions of China, but in the whole country, and creating a semi-fictitious past, which affects things like museums in China, whereby they say China has always been a unitary national culture, even 3,000 years ago, which is absolutely not true, by the way, but which is part of the uh, current process of uh, nationalism and replicates what was done in Europe when nation states, they equipped themselves, were invented and equipped themselves with semi-fictional or entirely fictional um, uh, histories. But China is not Taiwan, Ty and China is not Japan, and Japan is not India, um, and none of these Asian countries is Brazil. Uh, uh, and they're all different. So I think it's, 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 we should try and avoid imagining that the non-West is, 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 is uh, homogenous in a way that we are not and are um, not going to become. What happens in Europe, uh, um, March has suggested we'll be sort of forecasting um, uh, the future. Well, um, I think Woody Allen had a, one a good comment on that. You know, his prediction is always difficult, especially when it concerns the future. But, um, so I, but all I can, I would only make one comment. I don't believe the fiscal problems of Greece and um, beyond Greece, Spain, um, I don't believe these problems are soluble within existing institutions. I don't believe that... Um, uh, they can be staved off, there can be more bailouts, there can be various kinds of um, 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 uh, mitigating policies which will undoubtedly be adopted because the consequences of a breakdown in the euro are quite large. Uh, the ripple effects on the rest of you are really quite large, even if it was only one or two. Even, yeah, there'll be enormous attempts. Every conceivable resource will be mobilized to prevent an actual um, breakdown or, def or, or, or exiting of any country from the euro because of the integrity of the whole system. But, but I doubt that these can be uh, 
um, successful, partly for the reason that was suggested, which is that nothing like a European polity has been generated, nothing like European democratic solidarity has been created. There is no European demos and there won't be. So that there won't be any, anything in, Britain, in Europe that resembles the United States, a very successful experiment in nation building, but which is successful partly because putting the indigenous inhabitants on one side, it was a nation of voluntary, um, largely voluntary immigration, and putting the slaves aside as well, of course. Um, um, Europe is long settled and has many internal conflicts. The countries in it are at very different levels of in economic and other types of development. I think essentially the institutions we've inherited now, not those that were built after the war, which worked very well and worked for 20, 30 years, have become brittle utopian structures which are in the process of breaking down. So the question is how that breaking down. At the end of it, you might have a smaller Europe which is more stable and more resilient and more robust, or you might have a larger crisis. But I don't believe that these institutions are fixed. Um, uh, uh, um, are fixed uh, permanent features of the European landscape. And I don't share the view which, for example, Oscar Fischer developed a year or two ago and perhaps held, long held, which is that a crisis was inevitable but would, would push these institutions further to deep integration. That was the theory. He said there will be a crisis and the result of the crisis will be, well, we've had the crisis. And further crisis has been staved off, but I don't think it's possible ultimately because the root of democratic solidarity and democratic authority and democratic legitimacy remains within nation states. So it will break down in one way or another. So what is the larger future? Now what I want to avoid is, I think it's a very silly theory, I want to avoid any theory, any Huntington-like theory of clash of civilizations for a couple of reasons and then I'll close. One reason is I read Professor Huntington's book maybe say I'm saying that there will be heterogeneity in the world, but it will not only be, or perhaps even primarily be, civilizational. Um, I think the idea of clashing civilizations is a mistake for several reasons. I say I read Professor Huntington's book, not just the original articles, but the book two or three times. One of my points of curiosity was how many civilizations there are. How many, how many uh, different groups, human groups, get, belong to this honorific club which makes you a civilization. And at one point I counted 13, but by the time I got to the end of the book, one or two dropped out. The Greece had dropped out for some reason. Japan had been absorbed in China. Jews were in for a moment, but then they dropped out. Um, and uh, I then asked myself, what is a civilization? And I sort of concluded that actually civilization for a person hunting it was an American minority. That really the book wasn't about the world at all. It wasn't about the international system. It was about American multiculturalism. It was a projection onto the world screen onto the global scene of anxieties about American nationhood and, and multiculturalism. And that's a great danger, I think. And I think it's a great danger working with civilizations exist. I don't think there's going to be a universal civilization. But they're not windowless monads a la, my, a la Leibniz. They interpenetrate. They're internally fragmentary. There's been a tremendous amount of immigration. All European countries now are to some significant extent deeply multicultural. So none of them can be seen as forming part of an integral West anymore. Furthermore, Latin America is developing in some different directions, and I'll conclude now. And um, um, America's, I think, despite its close defense links and so on, which are perhaps closer now than they were for a long time, um, is developing in other directions from, from Europe. So my conclusion is really um, heterogeneity or diversity is our fate and so the path of wisdom not lie, lies not in resisting it, I would say even regretting it, but learning to cope with it and even to some extent um, enjoy it. Thank you.